This morning, if you don't have a sermon outline, just lift your hand, and these gentlemen will be glad to hand one to you um, so that you can follow along with us. This morning, we have launched into James chapter 3, and this is a powerful passage of Scripture. We've said that James is like a stick of dynamite. It's very small, but it's very powerful. Over the next two or three Sundays, we're going to be looking at this issue of the little muscle that is in your mouth. We won't have a biology lesson or a physiology lesson, but what we will have is a spiritual lesson from God's Word about the issue of our tongue. And there's a couple of surprises, even for us this morning, that have to do with what we mean when we speak of the tongue. I believe that you might, as you begin to think through the issue, go, oh yeah, that's right. That's what this is talking about. Pastor James is concerned about real faith. Pastor James is writing the first letter that's going to hit the New Testament churches. It sounds like something from the Old Testament. If you read the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, it it has the same genre feel that there are wise sayings in it, but this is a little bit different because it is woven completely through with the gospel of Christ. So James is bridging the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant of the blood of Christ. And James, a half-brother of Jesus, is saying, yes, I too believe in him. I too am following him. And he is challenging the church to be real in who they are. So this is really beginning this morning a series within a series. The main series that we're in is the book of James. The small series that we're coming to is once again, like we studied partiality, like we studied the issue of works-based evidence of our salvation, not works-based salvation, but works-based evidence of our salvation, here we come to the issue of the tongue. We could call it the test of the tongue. We could also call it taming the tongue. How in the world do you tame the tongue? I know that some of you have nearly bit your tongue clean off at times in your life. Sometimes just by eating food or sometimes it's when you realize that you said something you shouldn't have said. And so this morning we want to look at this issue and take a nice good dive into it. Let's remember, for those of you that are new with us this morning, we've been studying the tests that James gives to the early church. He's written this letter. He's concerned that there's many people that are showing up to the little local Jewish synagogues all over the Mediterranean world and off to the east, and he is concerned that they're coming together, they're claiming Christ, they kind of... they're claiming to be Christians, but yet they may not know what that really means. And I know that in this room this morning that there are some who've come maybe for the first time. Um, Almost every Sunday we have somebody who either has not grown up in church or somebody who has maybe even never been to a Protestant church before. And if that is the case for you this morning, we welcome you. You're in the right place. And we want to help you get up to speed to know where we are. James has written in chapter 1, he's written to them about the test of trials. Fill that in, the test of trials. And his question is, do you trust God when trouble comes? Now, you can sit in church all your life, listen to this, and when trouble comes, not trust God. Just because you're here or just because your dad was a preacher, or just because your great uncle or your great aunt were saintly people, that doesn't mean that you too have been converted to Christ and are honoring him. And so one of the great trials that that James immediately brings up is what about when bad stuff happens? What do you do? And James, right out of the box, says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds. Look at the second one there. He talks about the test of temptation to blame God. Human beings are really good, like middle school teenagers, very often, at shifting blame. Now, middle school teenagers, I'm not getting on to you too hard, but you're in that stage of life when somebody brings up something, you go, huh, not me. 
I mean, I just remember um, in our house growing up, dad would just say words that were not allowed at home were, I know. You know, I know. We weren't allowed to say, I know, because he would start to tell us something, we'd go, I know, I know. And he would say, oh, no, mm-mm, you're not going to do that. But similar to that is this issue that when, when we start to realize that we are sinners, do we blame God or do we take responsibility before him for our sin? That's, that is necessary for repentance. That is necessary for turning to God. And so instead of blaming God, we take responsibility. Number three, the test of receiving God's word. You see, the bottom line James is telling us is is that true Christians receive the word. True Christians want to know the truth that God has spoken. And so they receive that word, which is able to save them and change them. Number four, he really meddled with us when he got into James chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. He dealt with the sin of partiality. I've added to that this morning the sin of prejudice, to prejudge based upon external things that you know or things that you see. And it's not just about color of skin, though that that is very much a problem throughout the world, but it can also be preferences about a myriad of other things, from ideological persuasions to um, issues of education or status or, as James points out, wealth. A rich man comes in and you give him a favored seat. A poor man comes in and you say, sit off to the side. He's saying, you're you're being very ungodly when you do that. And if you do that, how can you know God? If when you look at people, when you see the stereotypes and you, you immediately draw the lines of like or dislike, respect or disrespect, honor or rejection, You're not being like God. And so James meddles with us on that. He says, do you see people as God does or as man does? There's the question. Number five, the test of your actions. How do you actually behave? You can put that down below that. How do you behave? You know, the the issue of works. Um, Is your faith verified by corresponding or commensurate good works? Or do you just say one thing but live another? James is all about helping us see that our actions prove what we believe. Now, I I want you to see this, and I I put a little thing there in the center of your outline called the two appeals of Pastor James's tests. And this is as good a time as any to introduce this amidst these tests, because I want you to see this concept, and we see it, it applies to the the five before that we've we've just reviewed, and it applies to the one below, the issue of the tongue and the test of the tongue. And there's, there's two appeals that James is giving, and see if this makes sense for you. First of all, there's the evangelistic appeal. He, he's calling us to account, saying, I hope you really understand the gospel. I hope it's really yours. I hope that Jesus is really Lord in your heart. And and what he's saying is, what do you do when trials come? Do you receive the Word of God? Have you believed the Word of Christ? I mean, have you received the the picture and the plan that he has? Or do you act like the world and reject people based on the outside? Or do you you come to the place of saying one thing but living another? James is saying, if any of these things are true and are pervasive in your life, then it reveals that you say you know God, but you don't. So he's, he's concerned about salvation. He's concerned about, notice the word next to salvation. What's the word next to salvation underneath that? Justification. Put down below that. Made right with God. Have you been made right with God? That happens through one thing. It happens through the blood of Christ, through the death and resurrection of Christ. So James is concerned about evangelism among the church within the church. 
But there's a su- second thing, and I, I can't remember. What is the term when you make up a word? What do, you, what do you call that? Does anybody know what you call that? I know you could call it a George Bushism or something, but didn't he used to make up words? I, I think he made up words. But I've made up a word, okay? Look at the second one. It's not just about evangelistic appeal, but it's about disciplistic appeal. Do you like that word, disciplistic? <laughs> Um, modern vernacular doesn't like the word disciple very much. They don't really know what to do with that word. But it has to do, notice this, it has to do with growth. It has to do with your growth spiritually. And notice the word next to growth. What is that out there? Sanctification. So you have the J word, which is justification, and that is being saved. That is being made right with God. That is, a, I believe, a one-time transaction But then we have this ongoing process that is sanctification. This is put down there to the side of that. Being made ready for heaven or getting ready for heaven. It's this beautiful picture. You're not being sanctified in order to be saved. You're being sanctified because you are saved. And we're going to, this plays into the study of the tongue because we do confess Christ perhaps but yet we also do live in this world of flesh and, and bones and world culture around us, and we're not yet what we're going to be in the big picture. So the evangelistic appeal and the disciplistic appeal or the Christian growth thing, all of these tests we can grow in. So these tests can either, and, and, and I can't work that out. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, there's, there, there's no way for me to say, no, sorry, Jack Henson, that is just revealing that you don't understand this and you've got to get this straightened out and, and everything else. I, I cannot do that. It's between you and God, ultimately, in your heart. You, either the Spirit bear, bears witness with your spirit that you are indeed a child of God or not. And if not, listen, if, if, if this is applying to you through the evangelistic appeal, that's great. Let God's word have its impact in you and come to faith in Christ. Cry out that he would forgive your sins and become the Lord of your life. Confess to him that you need him. Confess to him that you're a sinner in need of his saving. That is what it means to come to him through the evangelistic appeals of James. And there's many who have done that. There's many who have come in to the study of James, had read James and said, I must not be a Christian. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's one of the purposes for which he's writing this. So that you can evaluate your life, you can see the standard of God versus the the reality of your life, and you're being invited to place your trust and your hope in Jesus. And so we we see that. But for Christians, for those who know that they know that they know that the transaction has been made, these tests help us see the road of sanctification and where we would need to be. They help us, they help reveal the issues of the heart. This is part of God saying, come and walk with me and be with me. Now we come to the test of the tongue. The test of the tongue. And I want you to see this. Um, there's, there's five things I want you to see on this side of the page. And then on the back side, you see our, t- our typical box. I've moved it to the back um, for this message simply because um, I want us to do some, some precursor issues on the tongue. Really, it's not just chapter 3, verses 1 through 12 that deals with the tongue. It goes over into chapter 4 as well. Um, We're not going to do that this morning, but we do want to see that James devotes a lot of attention to what our mouth reveals about our faith. Notice here, go back over to page one on the front side and look at this first one. There's five of these. I want you to see the first one. The first thing that we want to see is that the tongue is mentioned in every chapter of James's letter. The tongue is mentioned in every chapter. And I've, I've put the references just below that. Look at chapter one. What does it say? What verse? 
19 and verse 26. I want you to see these. James mentions it in James chapter 1 and verse 19, and it's on the screen in front of you. Look what he says. We already studied this a few months ago. Verse 19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. What does it say there? Slow to speak and slow to anger. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So he's, he's already dealing with the tongue back in chapter 1. Look at the verse 26. And this is so important. I mean, this goes right with this whole study of the tongue. It's this, this one verse that's there in chapter um, 1, verse 26. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives what? Everyone around him? Is that what it says? deceives his own heart, this person's religion, religion is what? Is worthless. So you see, James, you remember with me, Pastor James packs a punch. I mean, he does not hold anything back. He doesn't use flowery language. He is very, very direct. It's very different than the writings of Paul, very different from the writings of John. James is far more in the mode of an Old Testament scholar, an Old Testament pastor, an Old Testament rabbi, but this beautiful picture of the standard of God mixed with the grace of God, and he's calling us to be real about it. Look at James chapter 2. You see, you see this one in James chapter 2, verse 12. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. He's saying, don't just speak and, ju and, and do whatever you want to do. He's saying, speak and act as if you have been saved, that you're under the glorious, fulfilled law of Christ. In James chapter 3, which is where we are now, there's, there's three of these verses that specifically um, mention the tongue. He says, so also the tongue is a small member, but yet it boasts of great things. Verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. <laughs> We're going to see what that means. Verse 8, he says, but no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. And we're going to see what is the, not this week, but next week, we're going to see what is the answer to taming the tongue. What is James going to get out here? So make sure that your husband or your wife is here next Sunday, right? You, you want to make sure they get that. How do, how do we tame her tongue? How do we tame his tongue? Um, make sure that we're all here. James chapter 4 and verse 11 says, Do not speak evil against another brother or against one another. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and the judges of the law. So in James 4, we're going to see how this plays into the church life. In James 5, he says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. We make many promises we make many statements. We, we very often project who we are or what we're going to do. And what James is saying, make sure that what you say with your mouth is really representative of your heart and your life. So um, that's the first one there, is that the tongue is mentioned in every, every chapter of the book of James. This is a concept that is woven throughout this beautiful book that we're studying. Number two, the tongue refers to, and this is so important, it refers to our words. The tongue refers to our words. He's not talking about the physiological, biological little muscle that you have in your mouth. Um, I did some study on the tongue. You don't want me to show you all of the studies of the pictures and everything else that I was looking at. You know, diseases of the tongue are just, they're, they're terrible. They're disgusting. You go, ooh, ah, you know, and there's... There's all these things that you, you look at. I mean, it's pretty grotesque. Um, but if we were to look in the human heart, then we would see something far more grotesque. Because you see, a sick tongue reveals our real heart. And so a tongue that's not healthy, I mean, you, you know, when you used to go to the doctor, uh, or when you go to the doctor, you sit down and the physical begins, you know, you're sitting there in the little bed sheet or whatever it is, and the doctor comes in and he says, and what's one of the first things he says? <laughs> Stick out your tongue. He wants to look at your tongue. He can tell about some th quite a few things about your health based upon your tongue. 
And I, I could ask Dr. Um, Ferris, Hannah, or, or some of the other doctors that we have this morning, come up and tell us all about what you can tell from a tongue. You know, if the tongue's the wrong color, it can, it can indicate vitamin deficiencies or mineral deficiencies. Um, if, there's, if there's swelling, if, there's, if it's too smooth, it, I mean, there, there's, there's a whole bunch, a range of things that they can tell just from looking at the tongue. We know the same thing is true spiritually. You see, our tongue actually represents our words and our thoughts, our intentions. That's what the tongue does. In fact, what is, our wor- what is a word? And this, this is important because in this day and time, this is very confused in the modern philosophy of our age. Look at under number two where it says the definition of word. A unit of language consisting of one or more spoken sounds or their rep- written representation. So it's either phonetic sounds that are made or it's something on a, on a page. And then notice this that functions as a principal carrier of what? Of meaning. So the big picture of this is that words mean things. Words actually mean something. Now, our our society is is in a mode right now where the, the meaning of words and the meaning of language is increasingly ambiguous. There's increasingly the difference between ideological dictionaries. And that's important that that we need to understand that as Christians because whoever controls the dictionary controls the debate. When you speak of various concepts, what we mean by those words is very, very critical. And this is an issue that is intimately associated with God himself. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very absolute, very clear. In fact, we see in the Scripture throughout, John calls Jesus the Word. He is the living Word. He is the Logos. He he is the essence of truth, but he's more than that. He is a creator God that rules and reigns, and he does so through beauty of his holiness and through logic and through the issue of, of thoughts. And we have been made in his image where we can process, listen, we can process linguistic concepts and sounds and and writings that are made into concepts that that actually communicate meaning. They mean something. Now, some of you have studied other languages. How many of you have studied another language at one point in your life or another? Almost everybody has. Almost everybody. I can remember when we were in language school in France, um, Cheryl Ann and Andrea were, I guess, seven or eight years old, and we had moved up to this small town in eastern France, and um, the, the... Kids next door would come over and play, and they would have a big time, and they would bake together, and they would do all kinds of things and do dolls and everything. So Marcy and I always looked forward to when the kids would get out of school and everybody would come home, and um, very often the kids would be in our house because Marcy just loved to have them there and have fun things for them to do. Well, one little young lady that lived next door, her name was Apolline, and Apolline was this energetic um, kind of live wire uh, girl, probably about eight years old at this time when I remember this. But what they didn't teach us in language school was the little nuances of, of language and sound. In this particular area of France, kids would rarely say yes. Kids would not typically say yes or yeah or we. Oui. Instead, they would go, mm. And you say, hey, Apolline, how are you doing? Good. Well, did, did you have a good day at school? Mm. And it was really, really funny. I mean, they sounded like little computers sitting there, you know, at the table. And they would, there would be, and there's usually no facial expression or a nod. What do we say? We go, uh-huh. We move our head typically, and we open our mouth and utter the sound. For them, it was just, mm. And that means, yes. Well, in a sense, that... That's 
a very base issue of a word or a meaning or a, or a concept of affirmation based upon the society around it, but much greater than that are the bigger pictures of words that actually mean things. So words mean things, and ideas and thoughts that result from them have consequences. Our words have consequences, and James is getting at that. James is saying, your God is a God of expressed thought. Your God is a God of expressed values. And, and your words actually mean something. I remember in the great movie, The Scarlet Pimpernel, that somewhere along the way, Chauflin um, is called to account because he made a promise to somebody he had arrested and they said, well, wait a minute, you told him, somebody standing nearby said, you told him that if he did this, then everything was going to be okay. And he said, well, an oath to a scoundrel is meaningless. An oath to a scoundrel is meaningless. I mean, that, that, there, there's, a, there's a wonderful picture of relativism in that that filters its way down into our hearts. But we see that God has words and that words mean things and that they represent. Well, number three... In our general study, we need to understand that the tongue reveals our heart, or our words reveal our heart. The tongue reveals the heart, and Jesus makes this so very clear in, in verse, chapter 12 of Matthew, chap, Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 through 37. Notice there, I think it's on the outline, yes, it's on the outline in front of you, verse 33 says, either make the tree good or its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is what? Known by its fruit. So the fruit is visible. You can go up and pick it. And you, you, you don't go up and pull an apple off of a tree and call it an orange tree. You know what kind of tree it is because of what comes from it. It's an apple tree. He says it's known by its fruit. Look at verse 34. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? It's so important, I've underlined it for you. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, we could stop right there. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, if we, if we were to look for a window into your soul, if we were to look for a window down into your heart and how you really think, feel, what you really believe, we could put a little bit of window right there and we could look at your, your tongue. Because your tongue is like that window that looks into the heart. And it's where we see what is really there. It reveals what is really there. Look at verse 35 in the middle of that paragraph. He says, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil tre treasure brings forth evil. Verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Verse 37, for by your words you will be justified and by your words, you will be what? Condemned. Condemned. Now, it's interesting. We studied the word justify uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And I believe that this is saying to us that this, that your words are going to reveal where your heart really is. So this is, the, the idea is the justified equals, it's verified. Your words verify what you say, that what you really believe, it's, going to, it's either going to be, fill it in, it's either going to be shown to be righteous or you're going to be shown to be a fraud. So Jesus is saying, your words will prove whether you have come to God and received the cleansing that only the Messiah can give or whether you are still in your sin. And that is ultimately what Jesus is speaking of when he's talking to the religious leaders that day. He's saying, you're still evil. 
You've not been cleansed. You've not been saved. You've not been converted to being a child of God. You are in your sin. You're dead in your sin, and your tongue reveals it. You're rejecting everything I'm saying. You're, you're, you're continuing to lift up your own religiosity. You're exalting self. And if you really knew God, you would receive his words. You would live by them. You would love by them. But that's not what you're doing. You're still evil. You're an evil person, so there's going to be evil words coming out of your mouth. Jesus is making this really clear that our tongues really reveal what's in our heart. Now, I, I know that, that very often I've heard this, and I've heard it at some key moments in my life, that somebody will say something, and they will go, well, I, I'm really sorry I said that. I didn't, I didn't mean that. That's not what Jesus said. What maybe needs to be confessed is, I said that, and my heart was wrong. And by the grace of God, I want for my heart to be right, so I don't say that. When I was in middle school, um, one of the youth workers here at the church had to take a vehicle up to Georgia. And he, uh, good friends of our family, and um, so we, we got in the vehicle, and he just, he talked to my mom and dad. He said, why don't I just take Andrew up there with me? We'll, we'll have a little bit of fun. We'll do a little bit of hunting um, north of Atlanta, and then we'll come, we'll fly back. And so it was real nice. I just went up, and we hung out with this guy's mom and dad, um, wonderful people, um, except that when they were taking us to the airport, in the dark of the morning, coming into Atlanta airport, even back all those years ago, it was kind of complicated. The car got, you know, the, the guy's dad got turned around, and he got lost in the airport, and we were going to miss the flight, and he got angrier and angrier, and before you knew it, all that was coming out of his mouth were unbelievable swear words at everybody in the car. And the whole time, his wife is sitting there looking back over the seats going, he didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. And I'm like, you're not convincing me. He, he looks pretty angry to me. And friends, we must not deceive ourselves. That's what, that's what chapter 1 verse 26 is saying. He's saying, don't deceive your own heart. If this is the way you talk, then look inside. And for Christians, if this, is, if this is what you're struggling with, then listen, come to God and be allowing Him to renew your heart and your mind so that He can deal with it. And we're going to talk about that more over the next two weeks. But the issue here is, is that the tongue reveals our heart. Number four, the tongue is the vehicle of many sins. The tongue is the vehicle of many sins, or you could put under there much sinfulness, the sinfulness of our hearts, the sinfulness of the flesh. The tongue just brings it out, lets it out, displays it. I, I'm reminded of the second sin. The second sin in all of humanity was a sin of the tongue. The first sin was what? Consuming the fruit. Think about this. The second sin is that when God comes to Adam and Eve in the garden and they've hidden themselves and he calls them out, they come out and they start talking and he said, why did you hide yourself? And they say, because we were naked. And then look at the screen. In verse 11, he said, and who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Look at verse 12 up on the screen. The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree, gave me from the tree, and I ate. Now, look at what humans do. Blaming it on God. The woman you gave me did this. He doesn't, say, he doesn't just say, the woman gave this to me and I ate it. No, Adam commits perhaps a, a greater sin than Eve in that picture of initiating that. He blames it on a holy God. 
And so the, the tongue is the vehicle of many sins. We see it from the start. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19. I want you to see, or really I'm going 18 to 19, and this is only on the screen in front of you. Verse 18 says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from where? Are y'all looking at that? Let's read it out loud together. Look at, look at verse 18. Read, out, read verse 18 on the screen out loud. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Look at verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. What all does our tongue do? Notice on the outline below that, Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, it's not an italicized, it's just a list of sins of the tongue, and it kind of keys off of, of what we just read in Matthew. But look at these. Notice this. Falsehood. Do you see that there? Falsehood. One of the first major sins of the tongue is speaking falsehood. That, what does that mean? That means something that's not true. Our God is true. He is truth. And so one of the worst things that we can do is run to anything that is not true and speak anything that is not true. And as part of that is heresy. That's religious doctrine that is, that is turned away from truth. It, there's another type of falsehood. It's lying it, of any, of any magnitude. From, we, there's no such thing as a white lie. Falsehood, heresy, lying. How about this one? Bragging and boasting. If you go and you read your New Testament, if you read your Old Testament, you will see that bragging and boasting are serious sins. Flattering. Berating. It's verbal abuse. Cursing. That, and the difference between cursing and mere profanity is this, that when you curse something, it's, it's something along the lines of, of setting and, and wishing evil, wishing difficulty, wishing hardship on someone to be under a what? To be under a curse. When, you know, you look at the word, I'll never forget my mother going through the words. Um, one day we were in our Volkswagen and we're talking and I think I said, darn, and mom said, be careful. Darn means damn. Be careful. She said, and what does damn mean? Damn means God damn. What is God damn? It? Well, it, it, play it on out. God damn it. That means send it to hell. Be careful. When you hear God damn, the picture is that is, that is the worst curse that you could wish on someone. If somebody says, God damn you, what they're saying to you is, I want you to go to hell. I can't send you there, but God can, and so I speak my curse to you. Be careful with our words. And there's any myriad of other curses, but there's also profanities. What about crude comments? Crude comments. Oh, what we heard recently, locker room talk. What about slandering? I mean, that's, that's really what Adam was doing. Taking and twisting the truth, turning it back on someone. God, you gave me that woman. What about gossiping? Speaking of others when they're not there to defend themselves. Similar to backbiting and tattling. What about divisiveness? Antagonizing. Harsh criticism. Now we're going to really meddle. What about whining? Insatiable complaining. Grumbling. God's people grumbled when he provided food for them. They grumbled. 
How many moms said, well, I know how God felt. She puts it on the table. (laughs) Grumbling. These are sins of the tongue. But I mean, there's part of what we see, that that word divisiveness in that second, at the end of that second row, is is a key one in the life of the church. And we're going to see that James is talking about that. He's concerned that this isn't just a test for you as individuals, but this is a test for the whole church. Does the church run in divisiveness? Does it run in dissension? Does it run in in conflict and in difficulty with one another? James is saying that is not the way of God, and your tongue plays a huge part in that, as we're going to see on the second side. But look at number five, and this is where you're not going to like this, but that's all right. Number five, the tongue equals our fingertips. The tongue equals our fingertips. What do I mean by that? The concept is this. It's words. Remember, we said the tongue represents words, right? So it's words expressed. Now, how, how would this be the case back in the day? A parchment and quill. There would be a dried out skin that is there that is able to receive ink. And there would be a, a feather pen or a quill of a, of a some type of bird, and it would hold the ink and allow you to write these words so that they could be communicated, so that they could be stored and then shared, perhaps into a letter that could be copied, like James's letter. He would have handwritten this. This is before the days of typeset. This is before the days of Twitter. This is before the days of all of these things. And so it would be a parchment and quit. It would be the power, we say, the power of the pen. But as time would go on, it would come to paper and ink and the the printed word that becomes very powerful. And we know that Martin Luther set the world ablaze as they published the 95 Theses and then all of the theological intercourse that would go on after that that would work out the doctrines of true salvation against a corrupt church. And so it was those pages that would set the world on fire, as we will see. But not only that, but as I've mentioned here, it's keyboard and screen as well. That is our parchment and and quill. So when we are typing, whether we're writing a book or whether we're writing a blog or whether we are writing a, a text or whether we're writing an email, That is an extension of our tongue. Our words are the issue. Now look at the next page there. and The the text is there, and we're going to reference it as we go here. I put it on the back because I want you to make some key observations. I want you to be able to see both. You may not want to fold it over just because as we get down toward the bottom, I'm going to be referencing it. You're going to have to flip it back and forth. But look up there. The key observations that, that... as we think about what Tommy read and as we read it again, we see some very important observations. The first observation is, notice the accountability of the tongue. We are accountable. And that accountability, and look up there in verse 1, notice what it says on the top of your outline there in the box. It says, not many of you should become what? Teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with stricter judgment. Um, Teachers is the issue here, um, and we're going to see why, but circle the word we. James is a pastor, and he's writing, and when he says we, he's speaking of as a teacher of God's word, as a teacher of God's people. And so he starts, and fill this in, he starts with teachers or elders or pastors. That's where he starts. The accountability begins here. You hear about where the buck stops? Well, that's one thing. Well, where does the buck start? He's saying the buck starts here with us. We better teach the truth. 
Because to stand in front of God's people and to say things that are not what God wants said is a grievous sin. It is a dangerous thing. And so what he's saying here is this accountability starts with the role of a pastor in their, in their day and time. And we see that in Titus chapter 1, verses five, 5 through 9. We see that your pastor better be a person of integrity, and his words better be true. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, we see the same picture, the same picture of accountability, of being accountable to God. And so he's saying, this is not for those who are uncertain. This is not for the unsure. This is not for the fraud. You are going to be judged. Even from Christian to Christian, there is a greater accountability on those who are going to teach. More could be said about that, but I, I think it's just important that we see the first verse out of the box in dealing with the tongue is the accountability of pastors. And he includes himself in that. Now, fill this in, the bullet point that's there. He who feeds the sheep leads the sheep. This is God's design because truth is what we follow. We don't follow a personality. We are not to follow someone in, in their individualism. The picture is this. We are to follow the truth of God. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we're going somewhere. There's a path. We're on the path, and it's God's word that shows us where to go, what to think, and how to get there. All of the picture. And so... The, this is a, a very important initial start that the accountability is great, and it starts with those who say, thus saith the Lord. Now, also, I want you to notice this. While some will be fruitful, others will be proven uh, faithful, excuse me, while some will be faithful, others will be proven false teachers and condemned. And I, I, I just want you to see these passages from Jude um, we, you remember we studied Jude last summer, or summer before last, and as we looked at Jude, Jude was all about false teachers, false preachers. Jude was all about those who are, he didn't say they're not, they're not going to come, they're here, and they're among you, and they are, they are misleading many. And notice here in Jude verse 4, it says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Here's part of the deal. They're, they're teaching some truth, but they're mixing in various heresies. And those heresies that are mixed into the gospel is going to be their condemnation. And here's the deal. They are leading people astray. Oh, the, the danger of falsehood in this. In Jude chapter, or Jude verses 12 and 13, it says, and he describes them. He describes these false teachers. He says they're hidden reefs. It's like a ship sailing along. Doesn't know this reef is here. And what is going to happen when that ship hits it? It's going to run aground. It's going to tear up. It, it, it's going to be lost. There may be loss of cargo. There may be loss of life. So these are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear so they don't fear God. They're shepherds feeding themselves instead of the sheep. They're waterless clouds swept along by the winds. They're not going to rain and provide, provide nourishment. They're fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Verse 13, wild waves of the sea, casting upon the foam of their own shame, wandering stars. And then at the end it says, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So this issue of accountability for those who stand and teach is very important. But the accountability ultimately applies for everyone. 
the accountability ultimately applies for everyone. Just read your whole New Testament. We're accountable for the words that we say, for all of the things that we just listed. So whether you're a, a growth group teacher, who I do believe that this is referring to anyone who is standing to teach, whether you're working with the youth, whether you're working even with the small children, our words and our teaching is very, very important. But to everyone, we are accountable. Number two, not only notice the accountability of the tongue, but in these verses, I want you to notice the difficulty of taming the tongue. And that's really what verse two is about. I want you to see verse two um, up there in the top of your page. It says, for we all stumble. Now, he circled the word we. He's including himself in that. Even though James is direct and he's hard-hitting, he, he's including himself in the accountability. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So the, the picture is he's saying, we all stumble. It's, it's difficult for all of us. This taming of the tongue is not for the faint-hearted. Um, I, I just can't get away from verses 7 and 8 as well. Look down at the middle of that in verse 7 and 8. For every kind of the beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. You know, the picture is, I mean, why do we have circuses? What, I mean, what is typically the favorite part of the circuits very often? You, you, you not only see the elements who, uh, the elephants who are very large, very smart creatures, and, and uh, they can be very aggressive, but they can also be tamed. And a little 85-pound animal trainer can lead a 4,000-pound elephant and, and lead a whole train of elephants. And with a whip, with a snap of a whip and a, a light or whatever would be there, there's, there's the idea of the, the king of the plains, the lions who can come and crush a man's skull in his mouth. The lion can be tamed. But he's saying, oh, what about the tongue? The tongue cannot be tamed. It is not something that we can fix ourselves because it reveals our hearts. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at, so what do we do? How can this, what is James getting at? What does he want us to do? I, I had to think of this. I was just, I was really thinking about James, and I, I really respect James under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to share himself in these accountabilities. But it wasn't just James, half-brother of Jesus. Notice what happened in Mark chapter 3, verse 21. I want you to see this. I think, yeah, we have a slide. Look, look at 20 and verse 21. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, early part of Mark. And notice what it says. Then he, that is Jesus, went home, so he went back to, near to his family, and the crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. They're all coming around. They couldn't even eat. Nobody could eat, and, and the crowds are there. Look at verse 21. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Imagine James showing up, some of other... Jesus' other brothers, maybe sisters, and just saying, yeah, let us get him. Let us take him home. He's out of his mind. This is the brother of the Lord. This is the one who would eventually become the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, who would write what we're reading. But he didn't believe at first. Instead, he called his brother the son of God. He called his brother out of his mind. And it wasn't just James. It was Paul, who was formerly called Saul. Fill that in, Paul, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Look what it says right there in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats 
and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues and at D Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, that's Christianity, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So here, God is using James, who had formerly said that he must be out of his mind. God is using Paul, who unbelievable things had come out of his mouth. And then Peter. Peter, the open mouth, insert foot disciple. Luke chapter 22. Look at Luke chapter 22. They're at the Lord's Supper. And not, they'd already been through the thing of washing the feet. He said, no, you can't wash me. And Jesus said, well, if I can't wash you, then you can't have any part of me. And he said, then wash my whole body. And Jesus like, sit down. I'm just going to wash your feet. And, and making a point, trying to make a point, Peter, just sit down. You know, I don't, I don't know what all was going on with that dynamic. But I think, I think it is kind of humorous. But, and then we come to Simon, and, and that's Peter. Look at verse 31. Jesus is saying, Simon... Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Verse 32, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now look at verse 33. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Look at verse 34. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster, rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me, that you will deny three times that you know me. And if we really, if we look at um, Luke and John, not only did Peter say, I don't know him, but he, he, he cursed and said, I do not know him. And so here's Peter with a tongue that gets himself in trouble having denied the Lord, but yet would stand and preach at Pentecost, and thousands of people would come to faith. And that for year after year after year, he, along with James and others, would preach the gospel faithfully as they sought to be faithful to God's Word. Now, they're not perfect. There's times of correction. We see that in their lives. But what is their life characterized by? It's characterized by the gospel. And that's part of the picture of what we see in verse 2 where he says, perfect. Does this mean sinless? And I would say, no, it, it can also mean mature. It can mean sinless, but we know that there's no hope of sinlessness until we get to heaven. But that doesn't give us a license to sin as we please. We see that there is the picture of maturity, and that's part of that sanctification process that we were speaking of. Either way, James is saying that the tongue is an ultimate test of one's faith and one's maturity. Number three, as we get near the end, notice in these verses a disproportionate danger of the tongue. It's a disproportionate danger of the tongue. And this is, this is what he's going to say. Look at verse 3. Look up there at the screen or at the, uh, on the box on the page at verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Verse 4. Look at the ships. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small what? Rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, but yet it boasts of great things. So go back in that. Verse 3, circle the word horse. In verse 4, circle the word ship. And now we come to the middle part of verse 5 that says, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small circle at fire. So the tongue is compared to these three things. It's small, fill it in, it's small, but it's powerful. It's very small, but it has tremendous power. And he gives three examples. Fill these in. Horses, ships, and fire. You think about a horse. Think about this big, 
1,500 to 2,000 pound animal. Horses are so strong and so usable, one of our main units of energy and measure of power is that we use the word what? Horsepower. How much horsepower is that? And there's this long equation that will explain to you what horsepower is. But the bottom line is about a 1,500-pound horse can lift about 4,500 pounds over a period of one minute because it is so powerful. Where is it would take a, a, a weightlifting human being a much longer period of time using other methods of leverage, using a much longer period of time in order to lift the same amount of weight. A horse is, is vastly more powerful than a man. That's why you don't see men out there up in Amish country hooked up to a harness walking through the field pulling the plow. Instead, he is there with the reins of a horse harnessing the power of the horse, telling the horse where to go and what. And it's very interesting that horses are designed to be controlled. This is a bit and bridle. Horses are designed to be, to be controlled by this this very simple piece of metal right here. It's called the bit. And the bit goes in the horse's mouth, comfortably placed, where it can be there just resting in, in just the right spot. And that bit, when the reins are pulled on, and when the reins are, 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 are pulled, it forces that bit up into the upper part of the horse's mouth. And that pressure hurts a little bit. And that little bit of pain guides that horse to know what you want him to do. And he's learned that he can't just take off and run. He's learned that he can't just do what he wants to do. This is part of taming the horse. This is part of coming and training the horse to sense the actions of the one that's on his back. And that beautiful, powerful animal is able to be harnessed and used in a way that is really appropriate. But it's that little piece of metal that controls that powerful animal. What about ships? I have in front of you a picture of the largest ship in the world. It has been decommissioned, and it's no longer... Um, there, but it's called the Nock Nevis. It is 1,500 feet long. And the Nock Nevis, I mean, it, this is a bit of a comparison. By the way, the, the bottom picture there is the USS Nimitz. So we often think of how massive an aircraft carrier is. Just, just think about that massive ship. But look all the way at the stern of any one of those ships, and there's this tiny little rudder. And that is the picture of the tongue. You have this massive, powerful ship. You have this ship that can go across the world carrying tons and tons and tons, hundreds of tons of cargo. And yet there's this tiny little rudder so that the pilot can make that thing go wherever he wants it to go. Think about the power of fire. From such a small spark, a massive blaze is set. And this is James's picture for us. Here's, here's, here's what I want you to see this morning. Our tongues are consequential. Words mean things. From the, from the exchange of ideas to the exchange of feelings and emotions and expectations... In, in difficulties, our tongues are powerful. And it's not because they are powerful within themselves. I want you to see here as we close verses 9 through 12. And just look at your outline, verses 9 through 12. I want you to see this. He's talking about the tongue. In verse 9 he says, With it we bless our Lord and Father and Excuse me, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, underline it, these things ought not to be so. 
These things ought not to be so. Just put a line down there to that open space below, sanctification. You see, James is telling us that if our behavior is such as this, that we bless God and we curse our brother, that is not Christian. This ought not to be so. Look at verse 11. He gives these comparisons. Does a spring pour forth from its same, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? No. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What he's showing us, number four, is the gross inconsistency of a sinful tongue. If our tongues are sinful, that is inconsistent with our Christian faith. And so it leaves us with two big questions in light of the evangelistic appeal and in light of the disciplistic appeal. And I want you to see these. Number one, am I a Christian? You know, it'd be great if someone came today and just simply said, I think my tongue reveals that I, I don't know the Lord. I lie all the time. Or I curse others. Or I'm full of gossip and dissension. Or I'm manipulative with my family or my coworkers. I verbally abuse. You know, if, if these things are here, I think we need to ask ourselves, well, has my tongue been saved? Because when Jesus saves us, he saves all of us. He saves our wardrobe. We need to dress like Christians. He saves our preferences in entertainment. He saves what we say. And so the question is, am I Christian or... Am I growing in holiness if I am a Christian? Or have I been dealing with the struggle of gossip or dissension or whatever it may be, cursing, and that's been the case for 40 or 50 or 60 years, and it's never changed? Friends, God calls us to evaluate our tongue because it is a window to our heart. Let's pray together.